Stewardship is this concept that when God knows that we are a person that he can move and pour through, he's going to give us more to distribute more. It's not for us. Our blessings are not for us. He wants us to use his provisions for other people. to the last sermon of the greatest month of generosity ever. ever. Thank you very much. Ever. <laughs> ever. This sermon is titled this. Blessed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. And the big idea is this. Paul ref- reflects the teachings of Jesus when he tells the believers to be generous in giving to others knowing God will take care of them, right? Paul is recycling the teachings of Christ. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look a little bit. There's a lot of scriptures here. So you're going to have your Bibles out or your apps open, whatever it is. Um, There's just so much scripture that you can't put it all on the wall, but most of it will be up there, okay? And I'm going to read it all. So buckle in. We'll be here till like 1. You have a problem with that? Okay. Um, we're going to look at, first we're going to look at the, the writings of, of Paul, and then we're going to dovetail into the teachings of Jesus that Paul is reiterating. And I want to show you what Jesus says about finance. Okay. Oh, you probably heard somebody say, say this, or maybe even you have said it churches are always talking about money. <laughs> Pastors are always talking about money. It's all about money with these churches. I hope that anybody who's been here for more than a day knows that that's not this pastor's heart. But we are a people who want to know the full counsel of the word of God. And honestly, next to the kingdom of God, Money stuff, money stuff, I almost entitled this whole series called Money Stuff, but then I decided not to. Um, Money stuff is the second most uh, talked about topic out of the mouth of Christ. And there's a reason for that. Not because he uh, wants your money, because he wants your heart. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Not only did the, not the church as a whole not talk, about, not, not talk about getting money all the time, the church was always on the front lines of generosity and giving their money, their resources, and their possessions. If you look at the, the book of Acts, the very beginning of the church, people would take their, their stuff that they had and they would sell it. And it said that there was nobody in need in the church. Because people were being generous with their stuff. And it wasn't because uh, Peter was going, hey, everybody need to sell your stuff because we're passing the plate. That's not what he, it was just something, it was an outcropping of the nature of Christ in them was to be generous. Paul spends a portion of his second letter to the Corinthian church describing the importance of being generous in giving to the work of God. Would you open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 10 and read through 15. It says this. Now there is one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also be provided and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Who is the one? There is one who provides seed. That the one is the capital O-N-E. All right? And he says this, verse 11, you will be enriched in every way for all generosity. There's that word again, all 
You will be rich in every way for all generosity, right? Which pr produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the proof provided by the ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. Michael, get ready with that button again. Ready? So this is what we're talking about. When we give to the work of God, whether it be the local church or the world, what does that do? Well, we just read it. It increases and overflows many expressions of thanks to God. It increases and overflows many expressions of thanks to God. The work that these missionaries are doing that we are supporting is spreading the message of Jesus Christ all over the world. There are some missionaries on that board right there. When we put the pictures up, they will have a blank picture on the wall. Why? Because they are in such dangerous areas of the world that we cannot tell you. We can tell you who they are. We cannot tell you where they're going. Or we cannot post their picture. Because I'll tell you why. It's very interesting. If that camera over there were to scoop over to that and by chance show the picture of that person and it got on the internet, that person could literally be put in prison. One of the ladies came and spoke here a little while, and one of the things we could not do was post her message online. And I wish I could because it was so good. But these are the things we're talking about. But there, there are people out in the trenches doing the work in other parts of the world. And when we give to that, when we're generous, it, it results in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. That's what it does. It's not just giving for, the, for your sake. It's giving for the sake of the kingdom. 14, as they pray... On your behalf, they will have deep affection for you because of the surprising grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So Paul is talking about, he's talking to the church in Corinth, and where is he talking about sending this money? Back to Jerusalem. They're taking up a collection for the people in Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you something right now. Interestingly enough, the people in Jerusalem... They don't really like the people in Corinth that much. They're Gentile church. There's still a little bit of like, mm, I don't know, going on between the two groups. And Paul's saying this, if you show the love of Christ through your generosity to that church that's going through a famine right now, you are going to show them just how real your love for Christ is. And they are going to glorify not only God, but they're going to be thankful to you and know that you are the real deal. Okay? That's what missions giving is all about. Okay? Missions giving is about giving to the work of God in our world. It's very important. He emphasizes the power of generosity and that God desires his people to be generous in every way. Just a little earlier in chapter 9, if you look, if you look over at... Um, verse 6 in chapter 9, you will see an interesting thing that he says here. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let me just clear the deck right now. This is not an infomercial. There is no compulsion today, I hope, other than that which maybe the Holy Spirit might bring to you. But I want to give you a touch of what the Gospels say and what uh, Paul says to the church. Not on a compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
And God is able to make, listen to this, all, here's that word again, is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. There's a lot of alls in there. Let's, re- let's go through the alls again. Make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. What's the title of this message? Your blessings are not for you. God gives them to us so that we may use them for his kingdom. He's pouring through us. That is the principle of stewardship. Paul touches again on this in the first letter to his son in the faith, his first letter to Timothy. So Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 17 says this. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to be put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Whoa, that's a cool word thrown right in there. He said, he didn't provide us all things for our, you know, so our sustenance, so that we're sustained, so that we can get through the day. He said, provides all things for your enjoyment. That's kind of nice. This is a God who loves you so much, he just doesn't want to, you to survive. He wants you to thrive. But he wants you to do it out of a generous heart. It says, command them to, go, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Is Paul preaching a prosperity gospel message here? One in which God will bless us if we give money? I have a hard time with that question. Because in one breath, I want to say no. But in another breath, he says, I want, I'm going to give you everything you need to enjoy life. But I think the difference is when we look at it from our current position in, in the West, and we talk about prosperity doctrine and things like that, I think it's, it's very transactional. You know, if I give $10 to God, then he's going to bless me with $20. No, that's not, that's, not, that's not how it works. Stewardship is this concept that when God knows that we are a person that he can move and pour through, he's going to give us more to distribute more. It's not for us. Our blessings are not for us. He wants us to use his provisions for other people. So I don't think he's teaching a doctrine of prosperity, but a doctrine of stewardship. That's a big word in Scripture, stewardship. From Paul's teaching through his letters, we see that believers are called to be generous in their giving of money to those in need and generous in supporting what God is doing in the world. A person should decide what they will give, having faith that God will take care of their financial needs and give with joy and thanksgiving in their heart. That is what I think he means by true life. True life is one who can settle in their minds what God is speaking to them, can give with thanksgiving and joy, and then live a joyful way. Now, Paul is only echoing the same principles of stewardship that Christ taught during his earthly ministry. So this is what I want to talk to you. Uh, The meat of what I want to talk to you today is Three principles that Jesus talked about in Scripture when it comes to generosity. The first principle is this. Stewardship is the key to generosity. Stewardship is the key to generosity. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 14. 
I'll let you get, I'll let you get there. Matthew 25. Those of you who have your phones are probably there already. Like, come on, pastor, stop flipping pages. Let's go. 25, verse 14. For it was just like a man, this is the teaching of Jesus, about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. I think this is very important that we have to understand. He's, he's entrusting his possessions. Notice that. He's got servants who don't have anything. And he's entrusting his possessions to these servants to do something with it. To one he gave five talents. And to the other, two talents. And to another one, one talent, depending on each one's ability. And that, that really hurts us, doesn't it? In our, like, equity-rich culture right now, right? I'm telling you, we're not all the same. What? You, put, you stand LeBron James next to me, and you will understand what I'm talking about. We're not all the same. He's been given five talents more than me. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? We're all different. We all have different levels of ability and, and, uh, and responsibility. So he gives out these things according to their ability. Then he went on his journey. Verse 16. Immediately, the man who received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presents five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge over many things. Share your master's joy. I gave you a few things. You did well with those. You stewarded those things well. So now I'm going to trust you with more things. Enjoy it. Keep doing it. Pat in the back. Let's go. All right. Verse 22. The man with the two talents also approached. He said, Master, you get, maybe he came a little bit nervous. What do you think? Oh, man, the guy with the five. You gave five talents. Uh. I only have two. All right, here we go. He approached and said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have earned two more talents. Is that okay? The master said to him, you wicked. No, 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 no. The master said to him, well done. I want you to mark, mark the words that are used here. Ready? Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. What is the same? Everything. They're exactly the same words that he said to the man who made five more. That should encourage you down to the core. I don't have to be LeBron James. I got to be me. My job is to steward what God gave me. And to do it, you don't have to steward what God gave me. That's my job. I don't have to steward what God gave you. But you have a responsibility to steward what God gave you. And your blessings are not just for you. They're for those people. They're for the people that uh, live around this church. You'll be so shocked at how, it's so funny. Maybe you guys, maybe some of you have been there before. Maybe that's why you're here this morning. But I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll sit in the, in the cafe, and the people walk in the mall, you know, they're doing their walk. And they'll, there's a church in the mall. Really? And then looking around, oh, there's two spaces. Three, five. Interesting. I was out, last week, I was out in the foyer, and I was just talking to some people, and a whole family came through, and a lady's like, there's a church in the mall. That's weird. I said, yeah, it is a little weird. And she goes, that's very weird. (laughs) All right. We're weird. I like that. 
So he says the same thing to the person that he gave two talents to. Remember, it's, they're not, it's not their talents. It's his talents that he's entrusted them to. So let's see what he says to the man who did uh, some digging. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. Do you now? You are a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't s- scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went off, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, you evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have uh, deposited the money with the bankers. I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. This is Jesus talking, by the way. This is Jesus talking about money and bankers and interest. He, was, he knew what was going on. Give it to the bankers at least. And this is interesting what he does here. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. Wait, that's not fair. He's already got 10. Why does he need one more? Because he's going to use it the best. He's already proven himself. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have more than enough. That's us. To It doesn't even sound fair when when it's read that way, right? Whoever who has, more will be given. That's not fair. Give it to the poor person. Wait a minute. Hold on. We are poured into so that we can be poured through. Does that make sense? The poor, the people who need it, they're going to be taken care of through us. Because we're not going to neglect them. We're not going to uh, turn uh, to the marginalized. We're going to steward what he's given to us. So he wants people who are going to manage his resources best to take care of the most people. This is what he said in verse 30. And throw this good-for-nothing servant into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is Jesus's declaration to how we are supposed to use his blessings. It's not about us. Our blessings are not all about us. We'll get into that in a little bit more. Number two, poverty is a state of mind. Now you say, that's not fair, Pastor. Some people are really poor. You're right. But there are some rich people out there who are very poor too. Poverty is a state of mind in many ways. Now, I know there's some people who are really struggling financially, and I don't mean to step on their toes on this. I get that. That's why we have talks like this, because we are supposed to be the people that we are giving, our resources are being poured through. I get that. But I'm telling you, especially in the West, poverty is a state of mind. We feel poor when we're absolutely, amazingly, incredibly blessed. The rest of the world, I'm telling you, most of the rest of the world does not live in the blessing that you live in, that you were born into, that you came to. The world does not live in this level of blessing. So just as we talk about this, just keep that in mind. Proverbs 11, 24 through 25 says this, One person gives freely. Yet he gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but he comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Wherever he refreshes, others uh, will be refreshed. Whoever he refreshes, others will be refreshed. Think about that. That's a state of mind. We can give because we've already received from God. Mark 10. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17. And this is the story of a rich man who was poor in his mind. Here we go, verse 17. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I just want to just stop right there for just two seconds because I want, to, I want you to see the transactional aspect of that request. 
Good teacher, what must I do to get? See the transactional? Uh, he's, he's asking Jesus, what are the things that need to be checked off the box so that I can gain eternal life? And Jesus kind of rocks his world. Number, verse 18. First off, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commands, do not murder. He's giving him a, 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 a checkbox, uh, a wish list. Here we go. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. These two things go hand in hand. He asks him, why do you call me good? Only God is good. He's asking him, who are you saying that I am? Why are you calling me good? Are you calling me good because you think you can get something out of me? Or are you calling me good because you're realizing, like Peter, that I am the son of God? And then he gives him the commandments that are all the commandments that deal with transactions between human beings. Like the, the six commandments deal with transactions between human beings, and then four commandments in the Ten Commandments deal with our relationship with God. Okay? So he's going there. He said to him, verse 20, Teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. He's probably feeling pretty good right now. All right. I checked those boxes. We're good to go. I love this passage right here. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. And I have an inkling right here that Jesus loved this man like he loved Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And I believe that this is not just a story for our understanding, but this was an actual invitation. An actual invitation for this man who we do not know his name. He's only known as the rich young man or rich young ruler. We don't know his name. This is an actual invitation for him to become one of Jesus' disciples. He said, I, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now, if things had turned out differently, we might have learned his name. Like, like um, even Judas gets his name in the Bible, right? This guy was on the cusp of being historically renowned. And he has a problem. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. He said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. I don't think that's, I don't think that's a, a metaphor. I think it actually, Jesus says, come on, let's do this thing. Man, you are, you're a great guy. But he was dismayed by this demand. And he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished at his words. Again, Jesus said to them, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished, saying to one another, then who can be saved? Why, why, why would that question come into their minds? Because just like today, you know, we have to pick on the people in the first century. Oh, they didn't know so much. They didn't have the Bible. They were writing the Bible. <laughs> just like today, we associate material wealth with the blessing of God. We do. And we conflate poverty or even middle class sometimes with God not blessing a person, or there be something wrong there. They said the same thing. And so Jesus responded. He said, with men, it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. Now, why is this so hard for a rich man to get to heaven? It's not. It's not hard for a rich man to get to heaven. It's the same process for the rich and the poor, but it's about who the rich person is putting his faith in. 
is, is the rich putting his faith in himself and his riches to get, to get something out of God? I think it's easier when the, the burden of great wealth is removed from us, we can rely on God so much easier. But sometimes wealth becomes our crutch. So he's saying it's hard, but he says it's not impossible. All things are possible with God. He goes, guess what? You're not enough. It's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Scott, thank you for that song today because that fit really, really nice. And he goes on to say, as Peter, uh, as Peter asks him a question, he says, Peter begins to tell him, look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or child or fields for my sake and the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now in this time houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children and fields with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. We talked about that last week. He said, listen, the reason I think this is a real invitation for the rich young man is because it's the same thing he asked of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. It's the same thing. Guess what's different? They didn't have all that stuff as an anchor around their ankle. They were like, absolutely, let's do this thing. They left their boats. They left their livelihood. But the, 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 the invitation was exactly the same. We don't get to keep anything. We give it all because it's not ours in the first place. And we ask God, what do you want me to do with the blessings that you've given me? And if he asks us to give it all up, what is our response? Ooh, that's a tough one. Often rich people are poor in their minds, while people who are less well-off often are rich in generosity. Our level of generosity is a window into our souls. It tells us who is really our God. Is the God of the infinite resource, the creator of the universe, our God? Or have we set ourselves up as our ultimate provider? Matthew 6, 24 says this, No one can serve two masters, since he either will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve them both. You can't serve them both. All right. We're doing good. All right, here we go. Maybe only 12 today. <laughs> Number three. Your prosperity is not yours. Jesus was, uh, Jesus was adamant that every good gift that we had comes from God and that it comes solely from God. And if it does that, then it should be devoted back to God. Luke chapter 12. We're all over the Gospels today. I love it. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 15. says this. He then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive, and he thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? What? That's a good question. What should I do? God has been, God has been good to me. I have, I have more than I need. In fact, I don't even, this is an agricultural society, so money was not as much a bank thing as it was a barter thing, so his, his wealth was in his crops, right? So as he contemplated this situation, 
he starts to think, man, you know what I could do? You know, the pastor of my church put up a missions board right in the front so it can't be hidden. Maybe I should convert some of my extra money into some cash that I can send to missionaries. Oh, I know. Maybe I could up my, my giving to church to support, or maybe I should support more of the ministries that are going on in God's work in our area. Yeah, that would be nice if he said something like that. This is what he said to himself, verse 18. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus of grain. I will say to myself, ha ha, you have plenty of gr- grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. That can tend to be us. You're like, Pastor, I'm not rich. I, I know, I know that's a hard thing for me to say to some people, but I'm just telling you, I just want to let you in on a little secret. We are. I mean, if you're comparing yourself to somebody else in the room, maybe you're less rich than they are, but we are very blessed. Can we all just agree on that? Come on. I mean, we are. Nothing's perfect, but we are very blessed. So when you ask yourself, what am I going to do with the blessings I've been given? How is that going to flesh out? Many times we look at, and we say, you know what? I'm going to store it up. Eat, drink, and be merry. And you said, Pastor, you said, the, you said yeah, earlier, you said. I'm going to quote back to you your own words, Pastor. You said that God gave us everything for our own enjoyment. Absolutely. Absolutely. But he didn't get everything for our enjoyment. He said he gives us everything we need for our enjoyment. But everything you get is not for your own enjoyment. That's the difference. Oh, yeah, he will give you what you need for your enjoyment. But not everything that he gives is for your enjoyment. Don't be the guy with the shovel. Digging a hole and storing it up for the burning down perfectly good barns to make bigger ones just so that you can have more stuff so that you can be more pleased and yet you can... I mean, this is what this guy's doing. He's literally saying, he's talking to himself. I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. He has no friends. I don't know. He just... You know, He's talking to himself. I figure he doesn't have any way to talk to him. But he's like the epitome of Scrooge McDuck. What does God think about this? He says this. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Not rich toward God. We have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be rich toward God? What does it mean? God wants us to be good stewards of the blessings that he has given us. If we do that, God will know that we are a person that he can trust with more. As we steward God's blessings, we must see that our blessings are given so that we may be a blessing to the poor, to those who have need. Maybe somebody who needs a helping hand to God's work in the world. To be rich toward God is to be rich towards God's work in the world. I know this sounds self-seeking, but Scripture is very clear. That starts with the local church. What is God doing in and through this church, New Life Church? That 
deserves your support, both monetarily and ministerially. Is that a word? Uh, makes sense to me. Get involved. Make this, listen, the church is only as good as the people make it to be. Another place is missions. We are a missions church. We believe that Jesus said before he ascended into, into heaven, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Now, that doesn't mean all of us can leave and go. Some of us can't do that. But we can give to those who God has called to that purpose. We're all responsible for that. He didn't say, hey, you, you guys go. You guys eat, drink, and be merry. He said, no, go. Impact the world. Be generous toward God with what you have. And that also means special offerings for special needs. I'm so thankful for uh, people in our church who have felt a heart for the disadvantage in our community. I think you, Alberta, for your hand-in-hand ministry that that supplies food banks and things like that with, with uh, gift cards right now, right? Or, or what, is it? what is it right now? It's just gift cards, stuff like that. We were given tons of food before. Yeah, COVID kind of put a weird spin on that. But, and then other things like our crisis pregnancy center, our, our, our baby bottle drive. You guys, you guys always nail that out of the park. Thank you, Rebecca and Michael, for doing that, for having that heart. For Operation Christmas Child, I, you know what's crazy? Operation Christmas Child was such a big impact in our area that the places where you would go to get stuff for the boxes were like wiped out. That means that we're not the only ones. There's other churches. One of the missionaries we'll, we'll, we'll look at next year, one of the months next year, their main, uh, their main way of getting into communities to spread the gospel and I love this, is they dig wells. They say, listen, we're going to come into your community and we're going to get you clean water so that you don't have to walk for miles to get a bucket of water that you just bathe your animals in. I love that synergy in a, in a missionary where they're not just taking care of the spiritual side, but they're also, it's so hard to feed somebody spiritually when their stomachs are rumbling. When they have dysentery from bad water. I love that. So that's what we do as a church. That's, that's what the church has always been. Did you know? Did you know? That is the church who was, was, was the major source of social programs in the world before the government started taking them over. Did you know that? I watched a very morbid show the other day. It was an entire documentary on the plague. Want to get depressed? Watch it. It's the most depressing thing in the world. Why am I watching it? I don't know. It was interesting. The teacher of the class had like a crow. Oh, no, it was a rat. It was a rat. It was a rat. My, mom, my, my mom's watching it. That's why I watch it. Uh, it was a rat because they said that the plague was spread through rats. And like every time the scene ch- would change, the rat would be somewhere else. It was like, where's Waldo? I was trying to find the rat, and I'm like, am I even listening to what's going on? But they said in that documentary that the church, they stayed in the cities. Everybody was leaving. But the church stayed, and they were the primary source of care and aid to plague-ridden communities. Why? Because they're generous toward God. That's why. i gotta, I got to wrap this up. This is what Jesus taught, what Paul encouraged the early church to do, and what God expects all of us to recognize uh, regardless of our level of financial prosperity. The true church of Jesus must reflect the nature of God and mimic the sacrificial generosity that Christ exemplified. Understanding these three things, stewardship is the key to generosity, poverty is is a state of mind, and your prosperity is not yours. When we do that, get ready with that next slide. When we do that, 
God can bless us and use us to be, hi, ready? Let's going to turn around for you. The greatest people of generosity ever. ever. We can be, the church can be the greatest people of generosity ever when we exemplify the heart of God and do the things that Jesus taught us to do, we can be the greatest church of generosity ever. So this is what I want you to, to go away on. This is what I want you to go away on. Are you stewarding your blessings well? Just think about it for a second. Just, just think about it for a second. Are you giving to the local church, to missions, and to other needs generously? And when we, remember we said last few weeks, generous, generously, Christ-like generosity is what? Sacrificial. Are you giving to those things sacrificially? Could you do more? Remember I told you I, I ruined my heavenly rewards last week? When I told you about how God was working on leases in my heart to do more? Could you do more? If you're not giving financially to the work of the church, could you step it up by faith and begin to budget something? If you are giving, but you've not committed to tithing, maybe it's a conviction you need to have with your, a conversation you need to have with your spouse or your family in order to sa- sacrifice a little or in order to get your tithe up to the 10% that God asked for. If you are faithfully tithing and giving, maybe you want to think about re- uh, reorganizing your budget so that you can support our missions program more. Maybe you're doing all that. And I know for a fact that there are people in this room who are. Maybe it's time to get really ambitious and look outside the church. And as Lisa and I did with IJM, International Justice Mission, find a, a, a ministry that just jazzes your socks off. I don't even know if that's a thing. <laughs> but just, you, you, it connects with your own heart. It doesn't have to be through, through new life. It just connects. And you're like, I... I could give everything to this ministry. That's what IJM is to Lisa and I. It's a ministry that we just want to sink our teeth into. I'm encouraging you today to think about how you're stewarding the very blessings of God. I believe in this blessed state that we live in, we can do more. I challenge you to make this the greatest month of generosity ever for you and your family. A moment in time when you gazed into the great blessings that God has given you and decided to sacrificially give back to him. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we've had this month to talk about all the varied ways that we can exemplify the work of Christ that he taught us in our world today. How we can take on the character of God as the person who is the most generous to all of us. You so love the world that you were extravagantly, sacrificially generous by giving us your son. So Lord, I pray that in this moment we may decide in our hearts the level of generosity that you want us to have towards the work of God in the local church, in missions, and other things. That we would dig deep and say, how can I do more? And then we would, with full hearts and joy, give with a thankful and joyful heart. That's what true life looks like. We thank you, Lord, for our blessings. Help us to be good stewards of it. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus, who is the provider of all good things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great week. I cannot wait for next Sunday. We're going into our Christmas series, and it's called Good News. So be here. Bring a friend. God bless.